Hello and welcome to another episode of Breaking Mayberry, the show that really wants to tell you what a gallon of gas cost in 1963. I'm one of your hosts, I'm Marty Schneider. I'm the other host, I'm Dan Ludwig. Dan, quick question, how do you eat a grapefruit? Um, I, I honestly, as rarely as possible, but I think you slice them and then you you eat it like a watermelon? <laughs> like a watermelon? Like you, okay. you have like That's... a slice of grapefruit, and then you. I'm. I. I think should we redo this? Where I actually nope, know nope, how to nope, how to do nope, it, how to eat. No, a grapefruit? never mind. Never mind. Okay. Never mind. So, so the way that you eat a grapefruit, the way uh-huh. that human beings eat a grapefruit, <laughs> uh, is you slice it in half, uh, down the middle, and put it into a bowl. Put some sugar on, it, and then cut it. Uh, cut the little sections out and with a knife and then pull it out with a spoon it's kind of an involved process but it's delicious anyway i recently learned this that my girlfriend doesn't do that does she eat it like a watermelon am i in good company <laughs> like an orange really um <laughs> yeah like there's a whole process like much like much like uh artichokes there's a whole process to eating grapefruit you can't just like peel off sections and just shove it in your mouth like you're eating an orange or a watermelon yeah. i guess because it's an extremely tart thing unless you're my girlfriend apparently cuz she asked me uh if i wanted to split a grapefruit i said <laughs> hey please put some sugar on my half and she said what what do you mean my half <laughs> she just she just peeled that shit and just popped it um, it's powerful. You have a powerful just, girlfriend. Just a fucking power move. <laughs> just intimidating, but, but also so wholly incorrect that I'm considering moving out. Yeah. Like, I just, she thought I was mad when I asked her. Anyway. You were, so, in, you might be in danger. Like, this is, I have never really had an opinion on this one way or another until this exact moment. Sarah could kick your ass. Sarah oh, ab- could fuck you up. Just, just I, absolutely. <laughs> but it's just, that's such, that's such an in, like, a king level intimidation tactic. Just uh, some WWE ass <laughs> intimidation tactic. Like, uh, if fucking, if fucking Shawn Michaels started chewing on a fucking, grapefruit half then fucking daniel bryan just has to run out of the <laughs> ring just crying just like can i can i tell you of my own one of these i have seen sure 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 i i feel like the longer that uh quarantine goes on if you're staying with a partner you're gonna learn all the things that they do weird and wrong yeah uh, and that's mine also side note I, men don't eat fruit I, I i think it's been like a thing that like Unless somebody offers you a f- offers you fruit, it's just like I am having some fruit and offers you a piece. Guys don't do that. We all have basically scurvy. Yeah, I- yeah. This is actually. I mean, because I will. If someone is like, "Hey, would you like a pear?" I'd be like, "I'd love a delicious pear. That sounds delightful." Sure. But if no one offers me a pear, then no. And usually, when I do eat fruit, my body reacts like. What is this? What have you done? Is this poison? What? I don't know what to do. Uh, so, yeah, kind of, is that a dude thing? I thought I, I was think just it, a man I child. Might, I think it might be a dude thing. It might it might be just one of our weird, like, stunt, like gross stunted things. I don't know. I have no idea. But I, we, men don't choose to eat fruit. We don't pick fruit for ourselves. It's, it's not, it's just not something that occurs to me. I love, I, sometimes I will get fruit and I'll, I'll like see the apples and I'll be like, oh my God, look, apples. I forgot you could buy these. I can just have these in my home for whenever I need a treat. And, and like once a month, once, once a month, once every like year, I'd be like, you, did you guys know you can just buy peaches and have them and just have like, a bag of peaches? Did all of you know about this fucking game changer? So, <laughs> like, I'm just walking out of the grocery store holding a thing of pears, just like, is this allowed? Is someone going to tackle me? <laughs> just, just looking for the cops? I have an example of this that 
ha- that you've reminded me of that I I must have blocked out because it was too much to think about in a in, on a day to day basis. I used to hang out with uh, a a guy in college who would just eat an onion like an apple <laughs> in the middle of our college campus in one of the most mind bending power moves I've ever seen. Just straight up Tony Abbotting that shit. That's a call for our for our Australian listeners. Um, <laughs> Just fucking like we would be hanging out, talking, standing in the middle of a crowded walkway, and he would just take out an onion, peel it a little bit, and bite into the onion like it is an apple. One time did offer me a bite of his onion, and I did do it, and it was honestly delicious. It depends on the type of onion, right? Like, if it's like a Vidalia or like a sweet onion, you could probably eat one of those bad boys. You know, it, it was rock. like a white but it, onion. But it's but it's really, it's the matter of fact, the nature of just chomping down on that shit. Like, just, like the, the fucking onion juice spraying everywhere? That is, like, if I was writing a sci-fi novel where an alien is in a human disguise... <laughs> And other people are figuring out that that guy's secretly an alien. That would be giveaway number one. See, all right, I'm going to counter you because I think if you were doing like a trashy romance novel, that's how you would like establish the main character, like the main dude's like brutish masculinity in a way that would make the reader go like, oh, wow, what's this guy's deal? Like that That's like, how he be- that's how he becomes Heathcliff. <laughs> uh, Bronte sisters Heathcliff, not Sunday funny Heathcliff. Not the one who terrorizes the neighborhood. Oh, <laughs> uh, he did romantically. I got nothing. I don't remember enough about Wuthering Heights to do a yeah, Heathcliff no. joke. Yeah, no. Like it would be, it would be like Jonathan Thickhorse got uh, came out of the property <laughs> chewing on an onion, and then just like like Beth sitting alone in her home and be like, "Whoa, what's this guy's deal?" <laughs> I like how you, as a romance novel novelist. <laughs> Lasts about three sentences before you end with, whoa, what's the <laughs> deal? <laughs> no, that was, that was the reader at home. Like, Pam, who's just, like, curled up uh, in her in her reading nook, is just like, hey, oh, this guy's geez. weird. I I assumed that uh, when you said Beth, that was a character in the story, I'm going to say Beth Tremble Cave uh, <laughs> of the Highland County Tremble Cave. <laughs> Uh, sees this guy jo- sees Jonathan Thickhorse chewing on, on an onion, and is immediately her feelings are sent alight at have ha- never having experienced uh such confusion and joy. Uh, she sees him across uh from her across her father's pasture. It's always her uh, father's pasture. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. She's she is of course some kind of duchess, Duchess Tremble Castle. Duchess yeah, Beth- she, she's the Duchess daughter of Bethany- a count. Yeah, Duchess Bethany Tremble Castle, and uh, Jonathan Thickhorse is there to. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, he's, he's he oh, he can't man the stables because that's too on the right. Nose. No, you can't, you can't. Right, we can't make him a stable boy. Uh, so I guess the thick horses. He's like are- the stonemason. Like he comes and just builds walls or whatever. So yeah, I guess that's do do you want him to be a do you want him to be another nobleman? Maybe he's like no, adopted no, like no. like he's, Wuthering he's Heights. No, no, he's guy. he's working class. He's, he's the working work, class. Yeah. yeah a little okay, rough yeah. around the edges, not actually like conventionally attractive. Okay, okay, but yeah. when he bites into that onion, it just spi- like it the onion sprays. juice is just, it's just down just his chest. Sp- spill down t- onto his pecs, which are of course fucking out. Yeah, just yeah, out. of course. He's got like one of those deals where it's like it's like a button down shirt, but he's done like half of it. It's a button down shirt, but like the the top three buttons are just like Gone. a piece of string. No, no, a, a, oh, a piece oh, of yeah, string. One of those a piece of a piece of black leather is just looped through it like shoelaces. Yeah. Uh. Uh, <laughs> I feel like we can, I feel like we can beat Beth Tremble Cave. I feel like it's just I feel like it's got to be like. Lady Bethany Tremble Cave is is pretty good. <laughs> what about Lady Bethany Tremble Mist? Tremble Dew? Ooh, Tremble Dew. Tremble Dew is good. Good. Yeah. Tremble Dew is good, but Tremble Cave sounds more yonic. Oh my god. Yonic, no, no, no. folks. Yonic, <laughs> there's a vocabulary word for you. Yonic is the 
opposite of phallic. I got it. I got it. I got it. Lady Samantha Quivermist. Ooh, why? Why the change from Samantha or from Bethany to Samantha? Samantha just feels like it goes better with it goes with okay. it better. Yeah, I'm okay, just feeling. I'm feeling mm, it. You know, I, I feel like these are two. Like, why not both? <laughs> I don't think jo- I don't Jonathan think- Jonathan Thickhorse has enough love for two ladies, right? There's there is the whole story right there. It's these two mistresses that are fighting over uh, the love of Jonathan Thickhorse. Also, you have to incorporate true crime into it. <laughs> they have to be hunting a serial killer. Oh yeah, yeah. They're, they're fighting over the same guy while also solving their father's murder. <laughs> Their their that's, father, their sisters, their sisters with opposite last names. That's gruesome. It's a very gruesome. This is the perfect romance novel we're writing because you have Jonathan Thickhorse, you have two women. It's it's he's eating onions. It's very erotic, and also it is a brutal, brutal true crime novel where like a serial killer is going around London cutting out people's like a guy and tying them together in ribbons. But he always leaves onion peels at the crime scene. Oh, and Jonathan Thickhorse has been framed. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. All right. I yeah, think, I like should this. we delete all of this and write a romance <laughs> novel together? Because I feel like this is printing money. So do you think, Marty, do you think that whole thing we just did was literally anything? I'm very <laughs> excited to find out when you're editing. I don't know, but it was 15 minutes. My favorite part of this is... For the past two weeks, you've come to the uh, pre-show and you've said, I have a great story about a QAnon truther that I met. And we're just we're just kicking that can down the road. Eventually, like this is the second week in a row that we're gonna we're just saving on that. It's by the time we actually get to it, it's gonna be legendary. Like, and it's gonna be so underwhelming because it's like Dan's gonna finally tell the story of the coronavirus truther he met, and by the time it, it's gonna be like. Oh, yeah, I met a super weird guy, and everyone's going to be super bummed out. We're going to have a vaccine for coronavirus by the time you tell the coronavirus <laughs> truther story. All right, let's get into today's episodes of uh, the Andy Griffith Show. We were going to do two episodes, but I don't know if we are now. Because <laughs> no. um, I'm going to trail off and talk about Jonathan Thickhorse a lot. Uh, here is the first episode we're going to start with today. Uh it is season three, episode twenty-two, "The Great Filling Station Robbery." Uh, originally airs February twenty-fifth, nineteen sixty-three. Written by Harvey Bullock and directed by. He sent a text to his granddaughter asking, "Who is K-pop Stan?" <laughs> Bob Sweeney, owner of a prestigious literary magazine, he has literally never read Bob Sweeney. And here is your one-sentence summary from Wikipedia. Andy and Barney investigate a string of robberies at Wally's filling station to find out whether or not a young employee is responsible. So, yes, that is the concept of this, is that somebody gets hired at Wally's filling station. Uh, really against Wally's wishes or knowledge. Yeah, uh-huh. oh, okay, all right, all right, so many... Andy does so much fucking stuff in this episode that, like, I couldn't even get a handle on if it was unethical because it would be like... Whoa, Andy, can you do that? And he'd be like, what's up? I'm doing another thing. And be like, and is that ethical? And he'd be like, I don't know. I'm starting another fire over here. Andy <laughs> Griffith out. As soon as you try to get a handle on one thing I did. Oh, was that illegal? I don't know. Check out what's over there. Oh, too late. You missed it. It's something over here. Okay, so the description, the one sentence summary describes the situation as finding out whether or not a young employee is responsible. And here's the issue I have with that description, is that, number one, employee is debatable, as is young, because this dude has, like, 37-year-old forehead. Yeah. He's got got this weird Blake Bortles-esque 45-year-old, 26-year-old kind of thing going on. Yeah, it's he's one of those. He's got, like, real Luke Perry energy, where it's like, how old are you? I can't argue... 
are you younger than me or older than me? I am genuinely baffled. Are you are you a very tired child or a very youthful old man? Uh, I will say one thing, and before we kind of get into this line by line, our new thing is trying to figure out how a problem can be solved without the use of the Mayberry Police Department whatsoever. Like, what would happen if you just didn't involve the cops at all? And this episode, I love it because it answers that question for us. Yeah. Because the Mayberry PD does Fuck all about this crime. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, that's, but we gotta, we gotta go beat by beat with this motherfucker, because there are so many spinning plates in this goddamn episode. Okay, so, so we start off kind of our pre-plot thing, uh, to give us kind of the theme our, of this. Our little is, skit. Yeah, is Barney, uh, he's setting up a speaker, he's setting up an intercom system in the jail cell so that he can talk to prisoners and also listen in on them. And Andy and Opie come in, they see Barney setting it up, they yell into it, they frighten him, and Barney goes off on his whole, like, well, it's time for us to, like, be technologically sound. We have to update this. Uh, we've got an intercom here, so we can make announcements to the uh, to the prisoners. Yeah. Andy, of course, says, you know, we could just talk to them. Yeah. There's, yeah. It's um, it's basically just like Barney wants it to be a super high tech modern jail, not, unable to come to terms with the fact that they have two fucking cells. No one really does crime in their town. Just a tale as old as time at this point. Yeah, at this point, uh, there's a very like prolonged period where uh, Barney is kind of explaining that he could use the intercom to spy on people, uh, and Andy, they do. Andy fucks with him. Andy fucks with him. Uh, I mean, it, it, do we need to get into this? It's not that amusing. It, it, yeah, he tries to like use new technology. Andy and Opie just kind of frustrate him for a prolonged period of time. Yeah, uh, this is this is a very big kind of one of the main themes of this episode is fuck you for trying to do something new, Barney. Yeah, uh, as our as is normal. Um, yeah, it's not. It is. I, hopefully he did not use police money to pay for that. Hopefully that was out of his own pocket. That was kind of what I was trying to figure out is like, where did the funding for this come from? And I think, I think we've talked about it before. I think Barney definitely has like a line of credit at an army surplus store. Or yeah. Like, yeah. That, that's probably out of pocket. Um, what, whatever the precursor to Radio Shack was, Barney's there every weekend. Uh, he's, he's ordering from the, like the military equivalent of Sky Mall. Andy does mention one important thing, which is that he bought a new carburetor to put in the squad car, and he wants to have that put in. So he goes over to the filling station uh, to talk to Gomer, who, once again, uh, people seem disappointed in Gomer for not being a mechanic. Yeah. Gomer explains quite clearly that he is not a mechanic, and he's explained this multiple times. All he knows how to do is the gas in the air. Uh, and everyone is just so let down by this. Okay, so we we do we need to uh, continue to talk deal with the humor of Gomer Pyle because it's bad. Because <laughs> it's it is not even like you have a dumb character, and the joke of the dumb character is they misunderstood something, or they because they are dumb something. They said something inadvertently funny. Some shit like that. Something happens as a result of them being dumb. And the joke with Gomer Pyle is, he dumb. Like, Gomer explains his job very slowly and aggravatingly. He talks about pumping gas. He talks about filling tires. He tells how much that costs. It is, in addition to being extremely unfunny, it is agonizing, and it is mostly, like, hey kids, come point at the fucking, I, I can't even, come point at the slow guy. Like, hey, check it out. Who You want to poke him with a stick? I'm going to choose my words very carefully here, because this yeah. is going to get us in a bit of hot water if I say this incorrectly. Looking at the way that they reflect Gomer, right? Looking at the actual, for lack of a better word, symptoms of Gomer's stupidity. Gomer's stupidity, quote unquote, I feel like I shouldn't even use it, is that he takes things very literally. Yeah. Like, if you say something to him, he'll he'll take the literal thing. Uh, he knows a couple of things very well and wants to explain them to you in agonizing detail. And also, he has, like... 
a specific way of looking at things and he has to remember things in a specific order. Gomer is, I'm going to say one of these, one of these writers had an autistic cousin, had a cousin who was on the spectrum. And this is like what a 1960s person would think an autistic person is like. Like, and uh, so there was no way of diagnosis. So if you had somebody who was on the autism spectrum in 1963 or whatever, they would just be like, oh, look at your slow cousin who doesn't understand things the way everyone does. Like, to be clear, I am not suggesting that autistic people are slow. People on the spectrum are slow at all. Uh, I am suggesting that this is what a 1960s person would think. It's, I think it is very open to debate which uh, version of slow they are parodying on this um, but it's not good no not matter good. which whichever and it, it, it could honestly be multiple right there's there's multiple interpretations yeah it's because they do not have and they probably do not have any understanding of like the difference between these things be, so these writers are be like hey i saw like i know uh, a disabled person who said this let's throw it in there let's just turn them all into one big disability stew it and the, it, it makes it crazier because the entire time i was like watching this i was like his spinoff is gomer pile umsc they take the de- the Developmentally, I'm gonna keep saying developmentally disabled. Neurodivergent, neurodivergent. Neuro, I think is the the neurodivergent the character, or or neuroatypical. I think is the word you want to use there. Yeah, yeah. They, they forest gump it. They just they just gump it. They, That's the no, easiest way. But they they they're like, all right, here's our uh, neuroatypical character. Make him kill. Give him a <laughs> gun. <laughs> like it's it's. <laughs> Like, are you, it's on, it's one thing that they do a simple jack. They do a simple jack. Simple jack. But, yeah, then, simple jack. <laughs> but then they're like, all right, simple jack, here is a bayonet. Go kill. We had a, uh, a real weird relationship with war on TV that I think we're going to need to get a historian in to talk about. Because yeah. remember, remember, at the same time, there was a very popular television show that was just set in a World War II POW camp. Yeah. It was just like, look at the wacky antics of this POW and this silly Nazi that keeps trying to keep them in. Whoa. Yeah. We had a real fucking weird relationship was, with this shit in the 60s. It was. And, and this still was, today. Like, wasn't this all during the Korean War? Wasn't that happening like now? <laughs> <laughs> it was it was slightly like if we're in sixty three we were slightly in between Korea and Vietnam. So like, it was we were right at the very beginning of Vietnam. It wasn't like one of these long stretches of peacetime where it's like, what was war like again? Well, I think it was pretty fun and dandy. They had just finished one, and they were like, "Hey, <laughs> hey, you know war." Wee! <laughs> it's like Care Bears. No. It doesn't count. None, none of it actually is. No one dies. Uh, it's like it's like GI Joe, where they're constantly firing lasers at each other, but no one actually gets shot. I mean, that seems to be America's opinion of those particular wars, even today. Like they yeah. don't count. They're not the real ones. Yeah. <laughs> No one got nuked. Um, so he- here we go. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to, you, you put it pretty ba- basically here. You wrote Gomer does Gomer stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, Gomer like goes over the details of his job. He explains how, how his job works, how the pump works. He basically says, Wally can't help you put this carburetor in. Uh, and I cannot help you because again, I am not a mechanic. Yeah. Uh, because and, uh, Wally is out of town, he's like on some business trip, gonna be gone a week. Um, so Andy is like, "Well, fuck! I need this carburetor put in." Um, two dudes just come in and just, you know, two very like non conspicuous dudes are just introduced as like guys that are putting their car there. You They're could just, honestly like blink and miss them. Kind yeah, of thing. like the the they're. they're yeah. They're the Hanson two, brothers. Two and, two guys show up. They, yeah. They're there, and they're storing their car in the garage, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, then the plot rolls up. Uh, an angry huffy man named Mr. Carter pulling in, in I don't know, Archie Andrews, age 37. Uh, yeah. <laughs> He's, his name is Jimmy, and he could rent a car. Like... Yeah. <laughs> 
he's, he's like, oh, what, what do you got here? Little Jimmy Morgan. And it's like, I, that motherfucker could probably, like, looks like he has fired me from at least one job. What are you yeah, talking yeah. about? Yeah, he pulls up the general manager of the Tasty Freeze. Yeah, uh, he doesn't even look like a rascal. He looks like an upstanding older man. He legitimately looks like Ron Howard. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> he looks he looks like like older Ron Howard. Uh, so anyway, he pulls he pulls this young man, this teenager, and he says, "And Andy, you convinced me to hire this this criminal. I knew he was a criminal. This you rebellious thought, youth. But you said that he would be turn over a new leaf if he had work, and he stole a battery from me. He stole a battery." Uh, Jimmy explains that he didn't steal the battery. Jimmy's just really interested in mechanics and spare parts. So he built a motor out of spare parts and he bought, he took the battery out of the truck. I guess to be clear, Jimmy's a delivery boy. So he took them, he took the battery out of his delivery truck just to test out the motor, says that it was really greasy. And so he dropped it and it broke. And at that point I had to pause and go, should, that means there's, Bat- what do you mean it broke? Yeah. What do you mean it broke? Because I have been around car batteries that have broken, and you all have more pressing concerns at the moment. Isn't that like, a super big deal? Like there is, if there is battery acid flowing all over your garage or whatever right now that you <laughs> yeah. need to throw some sawdust on, yeah, no, that needs to be taken care of immediately. Yeah. You just like we can deal with all this later, and also I would say that's probably pretty good evidence that. uh of Jimmy's story, but whatever. Mr. Morgan doesn't give a shit about this. I'm sorry, Mr. Cart, Mr. I'm keep confusing this. Mr. Carter doesn't doesn't care about this, and is uh, basically kind of like lays it on Andy's story. He's like, "It was your idea to fucking hire this guy. You are responsible. Fuck you. I want him arrested." And Andy is like, "I I don't wanna." And he's like, "Well, I'm either getting my money back for the broken car battery, or he's going to jail." Um, and Andy. Faced with a, like, a problem that is his, sort of his fault, or that he is accountable for, pulls a solution out of his ass and makes this very much someone else's problem using his authority as a police officer. He, like, is like, hey, Gomer Pyle? You know Gomer Pyle? Oh, man, referring to Gomer Pyle is such a fucking minefield. Hey, Gomer Pyle, the man with the mind of a child, according to this show? Uh, okay, yeah. Gomer Pyle, the man who, according to this show, has the mind of a child. Uh, come over here, come over here. You can make hiring and firing decisions, right, for this business where you work pumping gas? Yeah, no, I, I know you just said the word no, but the answer is yes. Yes, you can. Hire this man. This, like, put this man on your company's payroll. And Gomer is like, I can't fucking do that. My boss is out of town. And and Andy is like, I'll smooth it over in a way that definitely doesn't involve abusing my authority as a police officer. Because, <laughs> like, all right, if Wally is going to come back and he's going to be like, yo, you did, who is this kid in my garage? If you thought, if I could afford a second mechanic, do you think I'd be leaving my garage unattended for a fucking week? Do you think I would be, do you think I have money on that fucking payroll for this? Like. It's a mechanic. Like, absolutely not. And he's just like, well, I'll do some, I'll put you in jail. I'll arrest your family. Yeah, I, I, there's, there's no situation here. I mean, this is basically a classic Andy Taylor, like, I'll deal with it later. He specifically says, you get your money back, he gets a job, and I don't have to do any paperwork. Yeah. Like, yes. <laughs> uh, he, he, he also makes it seem like he's doing Gomer a favor because Gomer is like, Gomer's pointing out that there's a lot of, like, mechanic work that's piling ar- up around the shop. Because, again, Gomer Pyle is not a mechanic. Cannot stress this enough. I have no mechanical abilities. Go- like, and does... Oh, but, and- man, just do just doing the Gomer Pyle voice felt weird. I, yeah. I, ooh. Yeah, remember how I said that the advent of Gomer Pyle was going to be real, real bad for us? Remember how <laughs> yeah. I called that... Ye- at this point, it feels like years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's bad. We're gonna have a real tough time. Uh, uh, so, but so, anyway, yeah. So Andy does strong arm Gomer into hiring who, uh, Jimmy, who, who has who does not own the business. He's like Gomer. 
you're gonna get someone to fix all those repairs. To which Gomer would be like, I don't care. This is no skin off my back. I pump the gas. Like, this doesn't, if anything, I have inconvenienced grossly. You have not helped me. (laughs) Yeah, this is the second time that Andy has gotten his way by just inconveniencing or mistreating Gomer. And I, I, I have a real problem with it. Uh, Oy so, but that, that there it is. There's a setup. Now, Jimmy, the supposed like troubled teen, works at the filling station. Next scene is also gross as hell because it's just like four minutes of Barney calling Juanita and being horny. It is so upsetting because it's literally just like there's no there's no bit. There's no like he doesn't do a joke. There's no like knock knock who's there. It's just like hey Juanita. I'm busting out of my slacks right now, thinking about yeah. you, and and then just assuming on the other end she is also horny. <laughs> he tries to like phone fuck her while yeah. also making like a like a sexy rooster noise. That's that's he's he basically calls it like, hey, so I saw that you're uh, you're doing the morning shift. Just wanted to call and say good morning, cock a doodle do. <laughs> oh. Uh. I th- you might have to bleep that out because it, it counts as obscenity. Um, yeah, it's already right. so one one thing that popped in my head. Remember a couple of episodes ago when it was established very, 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 very clearly that uh, the entire town has one party line that is shared <laughs> <laughs> between the entire town to the point where if two women are having a prolonged conversation, you cannot call people. So what the fuck is, is just like, like someone like, uh, like Sarah, can you call the Donahues? Not right now, Tom. Barney's horny. <laughs> okay. Hang on. Hang on. I like where you're going with that, but I am going to make the argument that probably, probably the police station has a private line. And maybe that's why Barney's making all of his horny calls at work. Uh- <laughs> Not in the instead of, of instead of in his own home, you know. Do you think there's it's one hundred percent happened where Andy has just come in a little later, just like five minutes later, and just found Barney like like tugging it a little bit, not like <laughs> just, out of the pants, just not, not out, but just 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 rubbing the slack, the Rub- seams, just 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 up there on that inseam, doing yeah. an inseam check. Well, yeah. like yeah, there's been a couple of outtakes of this where Andy's like, "Well, how about whoa, oh." <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> and it just walks back out. So yeah, that's definitely happened. So that's that scene. Uh, except Gomer comes in and he mentions that he says that the filling station has been robbed. A robbery has occurred. Some of Wally's tools are missing, have been stolen from the garage. Oh, yeah, he wrote, said that he's been robbed. Also, Jimmy was the one that locked up last night. So, yeah. Gomer was not the last. They go to the gas station. Uh, they inspect the door. There's, like, the most basic of wordplay because Barney investigates the door. He's like, doesn't look like it was forced entry. No yeah. Jimmy marks. Speaking of Jimmy. Like, <laughs> all right, all right, fucking Harvey Bullock. I see why you named the character that just for that one line. <laughs> Little on the nose, Bullock. A pretty, pretty basic call and response, Bullock. Anyway, they ask Jimmy about the tools. He walks in. He's like, wow. Jimmy's like, yeah, wow. Wally sure has a great set of tools. I wish I could get my hands on those tools. I'm just now realizing how homoerotic that sounds as I say it out loud. Can can I do one more Batman? Sure. <laughs> wow, Bullock. Really respect your restraint not naming him Robbie. Could have made this so much easier on yourself. You're coming up as a writer. I'm off into the night. <laughs> to hunt Two-Face. Andy is, of course, suspicious of this. He's like, this. It, it's not that simple. It can't possibly be that simple. They talk yeah. about doing a stakeout. Uh, Andy figures that, like, the people who robbed the filling station once are going to try robbing it again. Uh, based on absolutely nothing. No, just uh, intuition. Basically saying, they don't know that we know that the gas station has been robbed, which, how do you know that? Wild assumption to make. Yeah, and the, Willie's gonna be out of town all week, so they're definitely going to hit it again. Probably tonight. Another 
wild assumption. Imagine, all right, imagine Willie coming back and just being like, okay, so to be clear, you hired a guy to my business, I was robbed, and the new guy had a precedent and mode of entry, and you didn't do anything because you thought, because you had a feeling about it. Yeah. I am going to burn your station down. Uh, so they're going to have a stakeout because scientific crime fighting can't beat waiting around. And then Barney gets an idea. And uh, I can't believe we're going to take Barney's side on this. But the next scene is Barney setting up a surveillance camera. Like, basically, he he, yeah. he, 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 put, he puts a camera up on a shelf facing the door of the filling station. And then he runs a string uh, through... The like awnings basically through the roof, the rafters, uh, and ties it to the door so that when somebody opens the door, it takes a picture of them. This is just Barney setting up a basic primitive ass surveillance camera, and the joke is, ha ha, Barney, you think you can fight crime with a camera, you idiot? It's it is the 1960s. That's the fucking crazy thing is like surveillance wasn't new. What the fuck are you talking about, Andy Griffith Show? Like, what's next? Recording criminals using audio, uh, audio recording equipment to get confessions? Crazy. You're out of your mind, Barney Fife. Like, this, the show kind of lulls you into forgetting that you're, this wasn't, this didn't air in 1920. Upon seeing the camera trick, uh, Gomer says his very first Shazam! Uh, is that his fucking catchphrase? That's his. That's his catchphrase. But is it really hit? Like, I don't feel like it should count as a catchphrase because he's saying it to make a reference to his favorite to comic book Captain character, Captain Marvel. Yeah, it's not his catchphrase. It's Captain Marvel's like catchphrase that he steals. It's. It is one hundred percent like someone at Timely Comics or whatever place owned Captain Marvel at the time was like, "Hey, can we?" file a lawsuit do we have enough money for a lawyer we're a comic book in the 1950s in 1960s so no damn it yeah oh i I think i think you you answered your own question there with whoever owned captain marvel at the time like i think they got in a loophole because like we have no who's gonna sue we have no idea who owns this thing right now no one knows who owns captain marvel right now it's 1963 the the writer of Captain Marvel ran up to the artist of Captain Marvel's garage where they ran their comic publishing thing out of him. It was just like, you will not believe how bad we just got fucked. D- so, somebody from Marvel Comics is making, like, Stan the Man is on the phone with Jack Kirby going, we own Captain Marvel, right? <laughs> we don't? How is that possible? <laughs> that was a huge oversight on our part. Oh, we're going to have to come into the game late with a guy with a weird haircut to try to muddy the waters a little bit. Oh, man. Excelsior. <laughs> In about 50 years, I'm going to make a, a TV show with Pamela Anderson that's going to creep everybody out. Uh, I'm Stanley. I'm Stanley. Rest in peace. Uh, yeah, so, where the <laughs> fuck were we? So, Barney sets up a, uh, sets up a camera, um, demonstrates it by, like, opening the door. Uh, Gomer, uh, Gomer says, Shazam! I can't, uh, you can't, I was gonna do a Gomer Pyle impression. You just wound up doing a Captain Marvel. <laughs> I, di- I chickened out. I, yeah. like, chick like, I was about to jump the canyon, and then I, like, like, pull, like, just took a hard right at the last second. I'm not comfortable doing them. That uh, night, that night, Barney's doing a stakeout. Uh, he's like hiding behind the barrels. Go- There's a bit where Gomer sneaks up on him. The stakeout happens. The point of the stakeout is basically Barney and Gomer are standing there. Uh, they are in the garage, and a hand starts to grab stuff from the table behind them. While Barney talks about how he must have scared the robbers away, and they're not going to hit this place tonight. Meanwhile, there's a hand pulling stuff out of the darkness behind him. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then um, the next day, Gomer is going over all the shit that got stolen. Uh, as Barney just, like, kind of... I mean, sort of justifiably is like, I have no fucking idea what happened. I'm so, I, I swear to God I didn't leave my post. 
freaks out, but I would freak out in that situation. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so, uh... There might actually be consequences for Barney Fife! Whoa, no! For the thing he didn't do wrong! He, he realizes that the camera is there. He basically says, Jimmy had the key. He must have used the front door. Uh, I got a picture of him. Ru- gives Gomer Pyle the camera to run off to the drugstore to get it developed like fucking Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Like, <laughs> take this camera and run, Gomer! And then uh, Andy basically says, like, well, I, kinda, I guess I gotta go fucking interrogate Jimmy because it's really the only thing left to do. So then they both, they kind of like grill Jimmy a little bit. He swears that he didn't do it. And Barney is like, well, there's proof coming. Yeah. So he runs in, he's got, he's got an envelope full of stuff. He's like, this photo is going to be of somebody who used that door. This is going to be definitive proof. So I'm going to take this photo out of the envelope and here's your thief. And of course, it's a picture of Barney, the silly Barney photo from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, uh, da, 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 uh, funny. Yeah. It's funny. And then they're like, well, I guess we still got to talk to Jim. Jimmy is gone. Yeah. Jimmy bolts. To be clear, though, th- we have to be clear. This episode does acknowledge that Barney is dating Thelma Lou. Yeah, because Gomer specifically says you can get copies of these pictures. You could give one to Thelma Lou. It's one of those where Thelma Lou is in continuity at the same time. As Juanita. Juanita. Yeah. Just just once, I want them to acknowledge specifically what the fuck is going on there. I just want them to explicitly say, Barney yeah. is cheating on his girlfriend. Or for Thelma Lou to just roll in and be like, we have an open thing going on. We it's- don't put labels on it. <laughs> Sometimes I fuck around. We're seeing, we're just seeing what, ha- we're just having a good time. I hooked up with Aunt B. <laughs> B brought me to heights of pleasure I didn't know I could reach. Later that night, at the jail, Andy gets a call. He gets a call from somebody who says that they saw a person moving around the cat, the filling station. And they run over there, uh, and they see Jimmy at the register doing something. So they go around the side to grab Jimmy, but as they grab him, hey! Do you remember that we mentioned two people at the very beginning of this? We said the we said these brothers, the Hanson brothers, showed up. Well, one of them was in the trunk of the car. He's Just this being a little guy, this little yeah. dude. And that, and that's literally how how they describe the gotcha moment of in this episode. Uh, he was hiding in the trunk, and they find him because they grab him, and then they hear this man screaming from the other room. Uh, because he's being electrocuted. <laughs> Jimmy, 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 like hot wired the cash register with like it, five batteries, not just one battery. He had like a coffee table of batteries. <laughs> yeah, so this dude is getting like a thousand volts through his body, uh, just screaming. Basically, like he's basically licking a fucking car battery. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's like Jimmy. Could have one hundred percent killed him, and when they like pull him off the cash register, his next action should be like, "Oh my god, I can't feel my legs. I think I peed. I peed. Oh yeah. my god!" But the the only thing that happened is he 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 was check this out, Barn. He was sitting in the trunk, yeah. which makes me wonder: was he in the trunk of that car for three days? Yeah, was he, he just in the trunk of that car? Just to sneak out at night. Was he eating? Was he peeing? What the hell? What? Even if they were, like, taking the car out and be like, we're gonna go for a drive and then bring the car back and store it here. Was then that's still, like, he's still in that car trunk for, like, like, 12 hours. So he has to be there all night. So, like, did he have a a really, really good book in there? And a bucket? For, for for what reason? To steal some car parts? <laughs> to steal, like, uh, some flashlights? <laughs> hey, like, they just go, like, the bigger Hanson brother goes to pick up the car in the morning, and Gomer's just like, hey, your car reeks of piss. Did you know that? <laughs> You're, you have the worst smelling car I've ever been near. And it gets worse over, like, it's not that bad at the start of the day. And then I come in the morning, and it 
is overwhelming how much your car smells like piss and shit. So, <laughs> so, so as I pointed out earlier, though, Jimmy would have done that anyway. This is yeah. definitely like it's a little vigilanteism, but it's definitely a, a example of a citizen solving the problem. The Mayberry Police Department does not do dick for this. Yeah, they actually, probably make the situation worse. Uh, yeah. Um, so th- yeah, th- this makes the how would they handle this without Mayberry PD much easier because they do they do it yeah. basically without <laughs> without any help. From Andy and Barney at all. Yeah, they actively prevent people from solving the crime. The final scene is an ode to Juanita Beasley's feet. And do I have that written up here? Oh, no. From from the ultra-reliable Mayberry Wiki? You bet your ass that I have have Barney's foot foot poem here, thanks to the perverts at the ultra-reliable Mayberry Wiki. All right, here it is, folks. Do you want to drop that in the chat so we can do switching off lines? Oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do that, I'll do that. Juanita, Juanita, lovely dear Juanita, from your head down to your feet, there's nothing half so sweet as Juanita, Juanita, Juanita. Dan? Oh, there are things of wonder, of which men like to sing. There are pretty sunsets and birds upon the wing. But of the joys of nature, none truly compare. With Juanita, Juanita, she is a beauty beyond compare. Juanita, Juanita, lovely dear, Juanita. Uh, and, and so he's reading this poem to her over the phone when Andy comes in and he gets frustrated. That's that's it. Yeah. That's that, the, the stinger of the episode. It, it's literally, Andy just rolls in and be like, hey, Barney, you horny? And Barney's like, <laughs> Like and, yeah, they, the they, zo- they zoom in on. They don't. They don't have any follow up. They don't say, "Oh boy, it sure is good that Wally decided to hire Jimmy full time." Uh, they don't say like, "Oh, glad we arrested that that thief guy." No, they don't mention it at all. The entire last bit of this is just dedicated to Barney's horn getting caught horny. Just like, it's it, it is. They've been doing this bit for so credits. long. It's just. It's just like, hey, Barn, you half mast. <laughs> and then credits. Credits. Yeah. It's insane. It's so terrible. I miss when he just played a harmonica as his reoccurring bit. And now he he does phone sex and almost jerks in the office. Ratings. 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 Uh, Andy meter. I think I liked it. I six. I'm gonna say six. I think I liked it as like an eight. I think I enjoyed this episode of television. The 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 bit with Barney and the camera is very funny. I think it helps because this the picture of Barney is funny. All the bits where we were like bit bit bit, with the exception of the ones involving Gober Pile, were pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It's it's almost unfair what we do here because we skip over all the funny bits because they're funny. Yeah. And you you don't want to hear us sit here and go, that's funny, that's funny, that's that's not an entertaining podcast. Yeah. It's it's like one of those podcasts where they just read people's tweets into the mic, but significantly worse, and we're not doing that. So yeah, I I, I don't know, I it was fine, I'm gonna still say six, you must have liked it a little bit more than I did. Barney Meter. Andy does kind of force his, like... See, I had a much more charitable reading than you did of the situation. I thought I was like, oh, cool. Andy Griffith, private citizen, is going to, like, make sure that this guy gets a job. Uh, He's going to do that. But then you pointed out this, like, oh, wait, no. If Wally could afford to hire somebody, he would. Yeah. Andy uses his authority as a punitive figure to force a, not even force a business to hire someone, to force Gomer Pyle to hire someone a thing he cannot do. The way that Andy kind of takes advantage of Gomer is maddening. Yeah, it's real bad. I mean, yeah, I think I think that's the main thing. Shitty, like, police work aside of just, like, 
staking shit out. Probably, I don't think they even called Wally to tell him that his business had been robbed. The police stuff in this actually doesn't bother me at all, because it shows the police as basically pointless and incompetent. Yeah. Uh, I have no problem with that, but yeah, it's, it's, it's Andy's treatment of Gomer that merits this as at least a seven. Uh, and, remember, every, uh, every single episode with Gomer is at least a five. That's true. Yeah, so I'm gonna put this at, like, an eight. Yeah, so there, there's where that one sits for me. Get ready for a couple of Barney meters to get broken. We're gonna have some of these motherfuckers go up to 20. Fortunately, though, the next episode does not have Gomer. Uh, yeah. We are a Gomer-free zone right now. I can breathe again. We're gonna skip ahead here in the season, going from episode 22 to season 3, episode 24, Ant Bee's Medicine Man... Originally airs March 11th, 1963. Written by John Whedon, who is the father of Joss and Zach Whedon. Shut the fuck up. What? Yeah. 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 The father of Joss Whedon and Zach Whedon and Jed Whedon. They were a, they were a, like a writing family. He also wrote for uh, Leave it to Beaver, Dick Van Dyke, a bunch of other like like 60s sitcoms. Something that uh, someone... Uh, someone said a while ago, I was like, hey, if you're ever thinking of, like, breaking into writing or directing or acting, do me go ahead and look up Hollywood family trees and yeah. just get very realistic about what your chances are, because everyone is related to someone. I mean, doesn't that explain a whole lot about Joss Whedon, though? Like, there's a whole lot of Joss Whedon stuff really in perspective now that you know this. Yeah. Kind of, well, do we, are we like Joss Whedon is a shitty writer now? Have we turned on Joss Whedon to that degree? I know he sucks ass. He's uh, a bad I mean, person. Oh, we want to get into this? I Joss Whedon is a bad person. He's also a terrible fucking director. Like, yeah. I've been kind of on the fuck Joss Whedon train since Avengers, basically. Uh, But I will say, like, much like Kevin Smith, his strength lies in dialogue and putting together casts of charming people and, and like... He's an amazing casting director and is probably very good at punch up. I will give him that. But yeah. also, he has this really like terror and it really sticks out in Avengers. He has this really terrible tendency where all of his characters kind of sound the same. Like they all kind of sound like Snark. It's just the default. It really sticks out in Avengers where everyone suddenly becomes a little bit Tony Stark. Yeah. Uh, ex except for Captain America, who he's like completely out of character with the rest of i have issues with these <laughs> avengers um, <laughs> but not buffy i mean i think i think we're all fine with buffy yeah um so yes it was written by papa whedon and directed by he stepped on a lego and was surprised to feel sexual arousal <laughs> bob sweeney <laughs> welcome to our humble little town drifter protagonist my name is bob sweeney i'm the trustworthy mayor with no ulterior motives <laughs> and here is your one sentence summary from Wikipedia. I like that one. Uh, Aunt B listens to a medicine man's sales pitch and ends up inviting him to supper. Yeah, that's pretty much what happens in yeah. this, actually. Uh, so, <laughs> so this entire episode is based around one two-minute scene. That they clearly were like, we really want to do this two minute scene, and we're gonna we gotta just kind of build an episode around it. The two minute scene is a bunch of old ladies get drunk. Like, yeah. So uh, let's let's start at the beginning here, though. Barney is your your notes are very funny here. Uh, the like beginning is just a big bit of Barney trying to comb his hair. Uh, and he's got a model in front of him, and he's trying to like follow that model. You've written. Barney is trying to comb his insane hair to look like dot 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 a guy. Who is that, I was I was like, am I gonna be told who that guy is? It's is Rock, that like it's Rock Hudson. I don't know who Rock Hudson is, and I okay. don't think I ever will. Even if you don't know what Rock Hudson looks like immediately, like if you don't know him by face, there is a caption on the photo on the magazine cover that Dan that Don Knotts is looking at that says what's rock really like so did you think <laughs> that it was just a, a magazine article a like, here's, a handsome man. here's a handsome man and also 
we're going to talk about granite in this episode. It was the 1960s. <laughs> there could, Rock could have been a common name. You don't know. <laughs> oh, he was just the only person in America named Rock. It's just, did you think like like it was a copy of Geology Weekly <laughs> with just a picture of a handsome man on it? Maybe Rock was that generation's George. Maybe that. I don't know, Dan. How many grandparents? Or they could have been talking about the music. I'm so, wait. Hang on, Dan. I'm. I feel like I'm being penalized for not looking at the word rock and immediately being like, "Oh yeah, Rock Hudson." Yeah, they've they've mentioned Rock Hudson on the show numerous times. That is All right. true. Uh, so no, I'm anyway. still indignant. Could have been That's- a popular name. You know how I know Rock wasn't a popular name, Dan? Because I know people who were alive in the 60s, and none of them are named Rock! (laughs) Maybe they all died! Or maybe it was a nickname for something! Maybe that! Maybe it was, like, like, Rock is a nickname for, like, Carl that we just got rid of? Maybe that! I don't know, are you a historian? (laughs) I'm not! (laughs) So, (laughs) Aunt B comes in, uh, and she's not feeling well. Uh, she's... Uh, she says she feels faint. She needs to sit down. Uh, Barney starts to panic. He's like, oh, you're not feeling good. And he just starts, like, touching her touching a lot. Touching her real hard. <laughs> he says, what should we loosen? What can we loosen on you? And she should, she would have been well within her rights to immediately deck him. Yeah, just, just pull some mace out of that giant purse of hers. Yeah. Uh, but Andy comes in, uh, and he's like, Aunt B, are you okay? Uh, and the whole thing, like, revolves around Aunt B getting some very sudden bad news. Yeah. She found out that, I'm not gonna say a friend of hers, because they weren't friends, but a woman named Augusta Finch passed away very suddenly. Andy's like, well, that's sad news, but I didn't think you and Miss Finch were friends. Like, were you that close? Why are you this upset? No, 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 no. That is not his delivery. He says, well, that's sad. But you and Augusta weren't that close. Not enough for you to be carrying on like this. So, yeah, he, he and, like, why are you having some emotions about this woman, woman? Yeah, it is much more confrontational than the initial read because it was like, hey, shut the fuck up. You guys weren't even friends. You barely knew her. Uh, and it's like, it's like, Jesus, Andy, a woman still died. Like, it's still a person in your life that left the fucking mortal coil. And Aunt B's upset by this, not because it was Miss Finch, but because she got, like, a sudden, like, shock to her system, because she and, uh, uh, Miss Finch were the exact same age. Yeah. Like, she was just like, oh, shit, a woman my age has suddenly died, which is, you know, an existential thing to happen. Like, when you, you get that news and you're like, oh, shit, yeah, I'm faced with my own mortality. Uh, Aunt B also has a very, like, reasonable complaint, <laughs> uh... And he's like, well, if you're worried about your health, why don't you go down and see the doctor, Dr. Stevens or whatever? I noticed they seem to have gotten rid of Dr. Kravitz. Yeah. So the only Jew around seems to have left town. Yep, around the time where everyone started going to the same church. She says, I don't want to go see that doctor because that doctor is just going to tell me that I'm old and not going to give me any help. Which is a real problem. That, yeah. Like, that is that is a recorded and defined problem that most... Lots of people, but mostly women have, of doctors not treating them seriously, doctors, like, uh, attributing every potential health problem to their weight, uh, to their hormones, to their age, and not uh, giving them as serious a diagnosis as they would men. I mean, we're not that far removed from hysteria being a common diagnosis. Yeah, so. I mean... Like, and and gender aspects, like, aside, if you, if I went in, like, into a doctor's office and they were, I was just like, hey, what's wrong with me? And they were just like, old. I'd be like, fuck you, old. What has gotten worse as a result of me being old, motherfucker? Do, are my kidneys working slightly less? You can't, your explanation can't just be time. If something hurts, it has to be because something happened. So, yeah, Aunt B is irritated that, like, she's like, I'm not going to go see that doctor. I'm not going to pay five bucks just to be told I'm old. 100% uh, I, agree. Like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with Aunt B on this one. Good for you. Uh, yeah. And she storms out. 
part of the reason I think she storms out is she's like, hey, Andy, I'm looking into the void right now, all right? I just ha- I just felt the Grim Reaper breathe on my neck a little bit. I'm kind of freaked out to the point that I had to come sit down and get groped by your weird friend. So, like, anything you want to say, and Andy's just like, go to the doctor! And she's like, suck my dick, and <laughs> storms out. Uh. <laughs> like, one... That's not, like, hey, I'm Andy. One, that she wasn't your friend, so shut the fuck up. And two, I don't care that you're worried about your mortality. I'm gonna live forever. Outside, Aunt B's on her way home, uh, and she runs into Opie and kind of yells at Opie a little bit for, like, not coming straight home. Opie's like, but I want to hear all these stories that this man is telling. And Opie directs her to... Like, an old Western-style medicine yeah. show. It's a man in a cowboy hat standing in front of, like, a traveling show selling yeah. miracle tonics, which made me scream at my television, what year is it? <laughs> we give them a lot of shit for playing very fast and loose with what fucking decade it is in the Andy Griffith show, but there is no way that there were traveling tonic salesmen in anything past like the 1920s right right i looked i looked it up i looked it up and there were still a few operating into the 70s and one lasted into the 90s but by that point it's mostly it's not the point isn't to sell tonics the point is like it's almost like a, like a gimmick in itself itself right it's like a tourist like, attraction it's thing. a tourist attraction thing like at that point yeah uh, so like it was it was like a sideshow as as much. Yeah, no, there's no way. So this dude is just selling tonics. And I started while we watched this, I started to think like, could we get somebody to talk about like MLMs and like healthcare fads and pyramid schemes and how they kind of prey upon women and older women especially who don't have But this isn't a pyramid scheme. It's not no. it's not an MLM. It's just selling junk. Yeah. It's 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 just pure well, or, snake I mean, oil. Arguably, it's better for reasons we're building up to. It's I think it's the least snake oil, snake oil. Like it's it's better than acaya berries. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. It's so it's basically you know fuck it, this dude's going full on Doctor Bonner's on this uh, yeah. with with just like a hint more racism because his whole character. Oh. The, the, this character's name is Colonel Harvey, and his whole thing is that he lived with Indian, with the Indians, and this is what he learned from their like witch doctors or whatever. I don't know. He's yeah. Selling, uh, I'm not. I'm not gonna fucking get into it because then I sound racist. Uh, his but- um his whole thing is basically: Have you ever seen a sad, sick, or fat Indian? Where I mean, I I know like Native American. Yes, yes, yes. He's saying Indian. Um. Wait, should we fucking say? Should we redo this and just say it? it just no, no, no. I think, I think, I think you're good. I think you're yeah. good. Yeah. Um. But yeah. He says. He says that, and that his whole pitch is like, well, they drink these supernatural blends of of flavors and and natural materials, and that's why they always feel good. It's a whole lot of like Oriental mysticism. Uh, it's the same deal as just like Chinese herbs that will make yeah. you feel better. Like it's 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 that shit. Uh, yeah, but he but he takes it a step further by saying like I have lived among these people and this is what I have learned. Uh, so yeah, good good old sense of like 1960s racism towards towards natives there. Anyway, Aunt B sees this dude and listen, I know we talk a lot and make jokes about Aunt B's horniness on this. <sighs> It's not a joke. It's not subtext. It's text. Aunt B I wants could, this dude's D so hard. I could feel the heat coming off of my television screen. I could have roasted a marshmallow off that fucking thing. Aunt B was a fucking supernova of horniness. Yeah. I'm going to give credit to Francis Bouffier, who played Aunt B. This is like the first time all season, possibly the first time in like two seasons, she's gotten to do anything uh and can we just say francis bouvier top top maybe not top 10 i'm gonna say top 50 horny actor i've ever seen she's up there with the woman that plays blanche on golden girls and fucking alan alda she brings uh she brings subtle but effective horniness to the table 
like with the best. What do you mean with subtle? There is nothing subtle about what is going on here. <laughs> she's not like she's not turning into a cartoon wolf and banging her head her head with a hammer. I, it's sh- powerful. Disagree. Agree it to is. disagree, my friend. She's just doing it with eyes, motherfucker. Yeah, the Every- eyes that are fucking bulging out of her skull and going awooga like a Tex <laughs> yeah. Avery cartoon. A- Alan Alda has to walk in and be like, I sure would like to hit that. <laughs> and like, like everyone else has to like, like vo- uh, vocalize it. Uh, she hang can just on, say, hang on. Aunt B can just say hi. And I'm like, oh, I can see the things that she wants to do to him. Very clearly. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hang on. I want to pause here for a second and just show how much this show has gotten to us in that you had a chance to come up with other references and your touching points were Alan Alda and the woman who plays Blanche on Golden Girls. You could have picked a more modern reference, but you said, nope, I'm going to go with Alan Alda. That's going to that's gonna really resonate with our 30, uh, 25 to 35 year old audience. Wait, can we, um, can you do like an edit in of like a third thing? Tom Haverford. Uh, just, like, put that, like, cut that and put that back. I'm sure it'll, like, snip in really organically. Honestly, I, I wish we hadn't done that, because Alan Alda and Rue McClanahan, much less problematic than that choice. But let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the problem, is, like, if you do a horny character post, like, 1990s, it's like, like, oh, rapist. Yeah, it, uh, it gets... Yeah, can't be, like, Barney Stinson. <laughs> She could have gone with Joey Tribbiani, but Joey Tri- that's the other thing, is that Joey Tribbiani was never actually shown to be horny. He was just shown to be, like, a guy that had a lot of sex, but didn't desire he, he the was, sex. He was just a himbo. Yeah, he was Joey Tribbiani, king himbo. Uh, yeah. Fucking shit. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> a lot about horniness this episode. <laughs> We're getting into the concept of arousal. After buying some of her the health tonic, the stuff that's going to make you feel instantly amazing, uh, Aunt B hits on this dude, uh, offers him a home-cooked meal, because that's her fucking move. Uh, we've seen her do it. <laughs> he flirts. Uh, and Do you want to eat some fried chicken and then something else? Yeah. So that that's it. I'm, mo- I'm moving on from this scene. Uh, later on... Andy and Barney see what's going on. Barney has this interesting note because, as you said earlier, the colonel's whole sales pitch is, have you ever known a sad or a fat or an Indian with ulcers? And Barney's just like, I don't think I've ever known an Indian. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, well, there's there's your thing. Anyway, Andy goes ahead and he, like, fuck it, tries to nail this guy. He's like, hey, you got a permit for selling on the street? The guy's like, yes, I do. And, yeah. Uh, basically, there's nothing like illegal that they can nail him on. Uh, as, and as, and she as, says, like, are you legally allowed to sell medicine on the street? And he's like, it's not medicine. I checked. I'm all clear. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's the very same thing as just like uh, putting a little disclaimer on the label that's like, these claims have not been verified by the FDA. Uh, and his shit checks out. They can't nail him on this. Then we hear Aunt B playing the piano. We fade to the next scene, which is Aunt B just pounding on this piano, having a very fun time singing with Opie. Um, <laughs> and they basically come in, interact with Aunt B for like five seconds, and she leaves the room, and they're just like, oh, Aunt B's wasted. <laughs> like... <laughs> Like, and that's basically, like, we can't really describe a lot of the bits because it's just, like, Aunt B isn't even, like, drunk. She's just very buzzed. Yeah, she, she's bouncing and, and she's definitely, like, I can play the piano drunk. Yeah. <laughs> at, that, at that phase. <laughs> the way they figure it, out wh- how, why she's drunk is Barney's like, wait, what did I come in here for? And he's like, oh, you were going to get your raincoat out of the closet. She opens up the closet and she sees that. Aunt B has drank half of one of these bottles. Just like, and these yeah. are large bottles. So she basically has like a 40, essentially. All right, so I want to talk briefly about the Colonel's plan here. Because the Colonel run, rolls into town and he sells snake oil. Except most snake oil is typically like you put some fucking olive oil in a thing with some fucking like basil and you mix in like some vinegar and like ba boom give me 20 bucks he was giving them like kentucky bourbon yes and yes. claiming that it was 
fucking medicine, which is also weird because he's been traveling all over the United States, which is not a dry, like, they're in a dry county, not a dry country. Yeah, we're not, like, again, not Prohibition era. Yeah, but it kind of is during this because Aunt B gets drunk and Andy's like, hey, Aunt B, you are drunk. And she's been like, drunk? What is that? Is that some sort of... Is 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 that like some sort of food that I've had? Can you explain what in in did you say intoxication? Yeah, uh, uh, here, on from alcohol. Here's here's my favorite bit. Andy gives Barney the bottle and he says, "Hey, run this over to Doc Andrews and have him analyze it." <laughs> to which Doc Andrews should be like, "What do you think my job <laughs> is? <laughs> I'm not. Do you think I have a crime lab? <laughs> what? Have him analyze it? What?" What? I'm a general practitioner. What the fuck? <laughs> Wait, you know Doc Andrews is just like, one sec, let me run this through the analyzer. Pours it into a box. Beep, boop, boop, beep, beep, boop, boop, boop. It's liquor. Yeah. I, I want, <laughs> the computer I, says that it's liquor. I, I want to, I would love there to be a deleted scene where Barney runs in, says, Doc, can you, can you analyze this for me? And Doc takes one look at it, sniffs it, goes, yeah, sure, let me just analyze it in the back room here. Goes in the other room, <laughs> pours himself a highball, <laughs> shoots shit down, and comes out and says, here's it is. And by the way, by the way, the result of the analysis shows that uh, it is, I believe they meant to say 85 proof, but what they say is 85% alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> they meant 85 proof, but they say 85%. <laughs> And that would eat through the fucking bottle. So, really, what they should be doing is arresting the colonel for manslaughter. <laughs> and he would be puking up blood. Dead. There's no way, like, there's no way you can open up a bottle of 85% alcohol and not immediately go, that's alcohol. Yeah, that is kind of the crazy thing, the crazy, crazy relationship this show has with alcohol, where a character can drink, like, half a bucket of straight vodka and be like, was that some sort of water? Uh, yeah, accidentally I, just do that. It was it was completely tasteless, but, you know, I feel a little funny. Like, it's so weird, especially because it was the 1960s, and again, all these people were drunk. Uh, very, very strange. So then, then the colonel shows up. He rolls through the door, and he's been invited. Remember, the colonel does not know that uh, the sheriff lives with Aunt B. He thinks he's just going to go see this old lady and and probably score and eat some chicken. Uh, <laughs> but then he's surprised to see the sheriff there, and they square off against each other. And this is the first time I've seen it. This is the first time I think they've let somebody taller than Andy on set. Yeah. <laughs> He's a very, like, alright, the colonel is Native American racism aside. Fucking cool. No, the like, colonel, like, like, wears a cowboy hat, has a mustache, does cigar tricks. Well, let's let's be clear here, like, it's, it's really understandable why Aunt B wants to fuck this dude. Like, he's definitely got some BDE flowing off of him. I'm not saying that the colonel's hot, but I'm saying, like, I get it. I get it. Like the colonel could get it. I think we're all in. I think we can all just agree the colonel could hit it from the back. The next scene, you're right. He does do cigar tricks. Quick shout out to Mister McBeavy, by the way. Opie, yeah. Opie sees the colonel like light up a cigar, and Opie's like, "Hey, can you blow smoke out of your ears?" Because that's something he saw Mister McBeavy doing. And then, the, and then the colonel just turns to Andy, and be like. So your child's unwell, huh? Basically, this this whole scene is just Opie being an idiot and being completely taken. Aunt B trying to do some drunk flirting, and then Andy just rolling his eyes in the background. It's not. Plus, there's yeah. some there's some bullshit na like native racism. We can skip all over this entire thing. Um, See, that's kind of the thing. Is like if you just truck on through the Native American racism, it's it's like a ten minute episode. <laughs> Like it's just huge portions of it are just the colonel looking in the in the camera, and being like, "They use shells for money. Uh, <laughs> they can turn into a bear at midnight. These are things about Native Americans." The next scene is Andy and Barney talking about it at the jail. Probably the next day, Barney's like, "Well, all right, I've got it analyzed. This is alcohol. We've got proof. So now you can go arrest that guy." Like. We've caught him doing something illegal. Go arrest him. And Andy says, yeah, but 
Aunt B will never believe it. We'll have to prove it to her somehow. No. Yeah. He says this. I know this is exactly his reasoning, and I want you to remember that. Or he says that we need to prove it to Aunt B. Uh, he then also mentions, like, the colonel's last stop was uh, a church function, like a, a ladies, like, church group. And Barney's like, oh, man. So he's just going to get all those church ladies plastered? And there it is. There's the big kicker is that they go. he goes back to someone's house. Is it his own house? I don't know. Aunt B is playing the, the thing, and... All of these women are drunk. It's just a bunch yeah. of drunk church ladies, and it's fun. Uh, interesting interesting thing that happens here. Aunt B looks at Andy and says, Oh, look who's here. Sheriff Matt Dillon, which is a reference to the television show Gunsmoke, uh, <laughs> which is interesting because John Danner, the guy that played the colonel, was on Gunsmoke. Oh. Like, so I mean... Every everyone single, was on Gunsmoke at that point. Everyone, exactly. Like, every, all these motherfuckers, like, their credits were just like, Gunsmoke, 300 other cowboy shows. <laughs> and then Andy Griffith But he, show. He, was like, he was like a regular character. He wasn't like a one episode, or he was, he was like a regular guy on there. Uh, yeah. So that's, so, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the, the big, big bit. So that's the big kicker, is that all these women are wasted, uh, and then Andy's like, cool, you're all drunk, and now I'm going to arrest you for being drunk in the privacy of my own home, I guess. Big. The big kicker is is basically Andy walking into the room and like to a bunch of old ladies and saying, this is a raid. Like that's really the one line that they built the entire fucking episode around. They were like, I want Andy to arrest a bunch of old ladies for being drunk. How can we make that happen? Right. And so he brings them back to the jail where they're all kind of nursing their hangovers uh, and pouring it. Can I just say here, remember, the whole purpose of this was to prove to Aunt B that this was liquor. I don't know about you, Dan, but every time I've tried to prove to someone that is drunk that they are drunk by saying, hey, you are drunk, it has been ineffective. Yeah. <laughs> this does not <laughs> prove anything. He proved nothing. <laughs> Which, all oh, right, okay, like he's trying to prove that to these women that do not understand what drunk is. That they that they are drunk based off of the fact that they now have hangovers. Like it's the most roundabout way of fucking doing this. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. You could have. <laughs> you could have done. I don't. I honestly, the situation is so fucking stupid, <laughs> so stupid that I don't know what you could have done because, like, this is an insane world. We're traveling tonic salesmen. Thank you, Joss Whedon's dad. Travel the country selling actual liquor. With a thing that is legal in 95% of the country. You know, I'm, I'm glad that, you, and I'm glad you reminded me to go look up Joss Whedon's dad. So John Ogden Whedon was born November 5th, 1905. So he's already 60 years old when he's writing this fucking, <laughs> he's definitely the oldest person in the world. Oh, so, is so, so he, he might remember traveling like, Traveling, sales, traveling snake oil salesman from his childhood and just be like, yeah, that's a thing that or, still happened today. By the way, he was... Uh, yeah, that's what it was, is he was like, I want to do an episode. I want to do something timely. Let's take down those traveling tonic salesmen. And the writers from the ending of the show was like, yeah, sure, man. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, let's do you it. Wrote, let's really give him what for. You wrote for Donna Reed and Dick Van Dyke. We can't say shit to you. <laughs> So yeah, he was he was already like sixty five years old while he was writing this episode. He would be like, "Now we need to explain to the young people what drunk is," and they're like, "I think they'll get it." They talked him down to traveling snake oil salesman. His original idea was a PSA about the dangers of cocaine and gum. <laughs> Do you think? <laughs> they had to actually change it so that the medicine, the guy wasn't actually going to be Native American. Do you think old man Whedon went for that? Oh, he definitely Do you think did. Every, every, <laughs> single t every single episode of the Andy Griffith show that we shit on, I want you to imagine that in 1963, there's one like producer trying his damn best and he's like, this is the best we had. This was our yeah. best take. 
<laughs> Listen, there was 100% a thing where old man weed and basically came and be like, so here's the traveling tonic salesman. And it's a fucking Italian guy in red oh, face 100%. with like a headdress on. And he's like, so I think we can ma- really make this character pop. And they're like, no, no, we're doing a colonel. Absolutely not. Uh, no, dude, it was this, like, like, I Dream of Genie was definitely pulling that Italian, uh, that Eagle Ice Cody ass shit. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, that was parlor well into the 70s, even in the 80s. So, that's it. Uh, Barney also comes and he puts the colonel in jail, and the colonel's like, hello, ladies, I guess I'm going to jail now. Uh, I'm pretty used to this. I'm super chill about going to jail, apparently. You get the feeling he's been there before. Uh, and the, basically the last scene is Aunt B feeling really bad about being taken, hoodwinked by this, and she does go to see Dr. Andrews, and she's like, well, I went to see Dr. Andrews, guess what he told me, I'm old, so I guess I'll just have nothing fixed and just be cranky and be slowly in more and more pain until I die, okay, okay, thank, <laughs> good, good to talk to you, I guess I'm gonna go off and, uh, cook and clean for you now, bye. And, and Andy's response to that is to turn to Barney and just go, Hey, do you think you might have cancer? Yeah. <laughs> Barney's like, I gotta go to the doctor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, for- I forgot. While this is happening, Andy and Barney are playing checkers. And I- this is a weird detail I noticed. One of the strangest games of checkers I've ever seen, because each <laughs> each one of them only has, like, four players left, and they're they're all kings. Like, <laughs> they're all kinged. I don't know. How hard is it to do an actual board game? Uh, so... So that's it. That's the episode. What the fuck, man? Yeah. It's it's terrible episode of television. It's terrible, and yet I'm going to give it a higher Andy meter than the other one. I liked this episode. Uh, part of it is because of the stuff that, that we brought to it. But as soon as, like, Aunt B, like, horny face comes up, I was jumping out of my chair going, yes, 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 yes. yes. I think... <laughs> I think Aunt B horny episodes are really special, and we need to like set up like a sound effect. Like it, it's an Aunt B horny episode. The air horns. <laughs> 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 Aunt B's trying to get it in. God, I wish the Colonel was like ninety percent less racist, but like uh, you know, I, I feel like I should just say I feel like the Colonel was a hundred percent less racist. I feel like there should have been zero racist. <laughs> I wish the Colonel was, had was, a single line that wasn't racist, because that was he would be the coolest. That was just me, for some reason, admitting that I'd be okay with 10% racist. <laughs> Why did I say that? <laughs> you, Thank you, Marty, for giving the exact amount of racism that you will tolerate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, wa- I hope everyone takes that down and makes a note of it about what Marty is willing to turn a blind eye to. Jesus Christ. So, yeah, on, on an Andy scale, like, I thought this episode was pretty good. I'm going to give it, like, an eight. I'm going to give it, like, a like a three. <laughs> it's a four. It's a four. Really? I, 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 I did not much I like this episode. Everyone's being so silly and so over the top of it. Uh, and then... Uh, Barney Meter, like, whoo, that 1960s racism. That is some potent racism. That is that uncut shit you cannot get your hands on anymore. Just pure unfiltered, man. Uh, so yeah, nine. Yeah, I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna put it at Let's go ahead, let's go ahead and say, like, beyond just the racism, there is also just getting people drunk without their, like, knowing their knowledge or consent is uh pretty yeah. pretty ethically dubious right there. Like, if I give, if I was like, here, drink, and plus, we're, we're just ignoring the, like, claims to health or whatever. Yeah, but, like, it, it, I'm gonna put it out of 10, actually, because that, plus, again, some, like, two scoops of racism in this motherfucker makes Peter Pan look fucking culturally sensitive yeah so uh, so yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna write rock that with you i'll say i said nine uh i'm i'm gonna keep i'm uh, gonna keep it at a nine simply because if there was just a dash of andy griffith no there's even some like messed up fucking entrapment bullshit from andy's policing so he he lets a group of women get drunk not because he like to prove a point yeah okay 10 he that's abru- a 10 that's yeah, a tenor. He, abu- 
He basically spikes the punch at a community event to prove a point that no one really asked yeah, for. Yeah, all right, yeah, that's that's a tenor. Jesus Christ! Wow this yeah. this episode is fucking wild. Um, it is a tour de force of what the fuck is wrong with you. So there it is, folks. Uh, I'm glad that we did a two for on this. This this episode is wild. <laughs> <laughs> this was a journey. All right, so. <laughs> As always, on the internet, where we fucking are. Uh, on Twitter, at twitter.com slash breakmayberry. Facebook.com slash breakingmayberry. Instagram, breakingmayberry. Support us with money at patreon.com slash breakingmayberry. Breaking Mayberry. Uh, music you heard before and after is uh, Max Ludwig, uh, who is on Twitch as Sleep Talkie. Watch his streams. They are fun. They are good times. We join sometimes. Yeah, everyone. It's also like sometimes unofficially the Breaking Mayberry stream because uh, we just yeah. don't feel like making our own. And that's about it. I don't think we've got any really housekeeping. Give us ratings and reviews, please, please, please. It would be so. It would be so It'd be chill. chill. Of you. It'd be real cool if you did that. Uh, other than that, that's it for us. We're gonna grab some guests for some episodes coming up soon. Uh, see if that's to look forward to. Uh, yeah. Oh wait. Let Let me try a thing. If you give us a rating or review and tweet at us about it, I will personally call you on the phone and talk to you about whatever you want for, like, ten minutes. Let's see if that does anything. Okay. All right. Like, yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, I, let's, let's, I can... Uh, let's, let's throw that bait out there and see what I can does. neither condemn nor condone this course of action, but all right, let's do this. Please, no sex stuff. <laughs> all right, so... There it is. We'll see you all down at the fishing hole. Good luck with that, buddy. Jesus oh. Christ. Thank you.